Next presentation will be David Keene. Um, I did ask David Queen a, com a, Keen a completely inappropriate question before we started. I asked him what vegetable would he be uh, if he were a vegetable? And I would not say his answer because I think he actually said it was a fruit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so David Keene, as we all know, <laughs> is a great friend to Studio Bell and the National Music Center. And I think it is a wonderful way for us to wrap up our conference this afternoon. So let, all, let us all please welcome David Keene. So um, before I begin, and thank you all for coming today, and uh, thanks to National Music Center and uh, Studio Bell for hosting this. It's a great conclusion to a long relationship I've had with this organization, and I really appreciate their bringing me in here today to share this stuff with you. Um, this is kind of what I've been doing since I left in 2003. Um, I was here for three years as acting curator or whatever, and brought a large number of instruments here. And um, so, I guess I'm not close enough to this microphone. Um, it's it's a it's a great way to uh, see what they've done in the meantime. It's such a fabulous facility, and, uh, and what they've done with the downtown core is pretty incredible also. But um, I mostly want Maurice Martineau to be introduced to you guys with a, uh, with a little video that we're going to play right now. Now, 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 now. It's a real musical instrument without string or wind. The sound is produced electrically by means of radio valve, but it's not mechanical. I notice you play with one finger only. That's right, because it's the easiest way you see, it's not necessary to touch the keyboard. But, if you like, you can play on the keys. Will you play some effects? Yes, certainly. Here is a trumpet and echo. if you will. Himself. Um, Maurice Martineau was born on October 14th, 1898, to Juliette and Francois Martineau, and um, was a fairly precocious young man. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about uh, Maurice's life, purely because there are some very scholarly and very complete um, 
works written about him, uh, mostly from Jean Laurendeau's book, which I quote from fairly heavily here, but Jean did a, a very in-depth dive on Maurice's life and that of his family and his development of the instruments, et cetera. Um, so I'll bring up a slide that shows that book and you can take notes for that later. But um, what we want to concentrate on today is just a, a unique opportunity to observe his creation from the beginning to the end. The, the first instrument that he built, the Model 1 as we call it, was pretty much, um, as we see here, I've got to keep my mouth on this microphone. Um, it's, it's a uh, radio, basically, and he was a telegraphist in, in the war, in World War I. In 1917, he finds himself as a corporal in the sort of the signal corps of the French Army. And um, he's uh, using radio for, you know, signaling planes going overhead where this, where's the target, uh, there's a barrage coming in, et cetera. This story is fraught with all kinds of different irony that I, I love to bring to your attention here occasionally. But um, So you've got shells flying overhead and mustard gas and, you know, the horrible trench warfare that was World War I in, you know, in the... Uh, it just, it just went on and on, and, and he was exposed to all this violence, and uh, at being a cellist, he uh, was constantly yearning for the human contact of music, the, the human involvement with music, and with, with purposeful sound, or even you know, accidental sound that could be appreciated in a way that soothed him uh, against the, acted as a salve you know, in, in all of this violence. And uh, he noticed that with the triode revolution that sort of revolutionized uh, electronics in that era, and we get all sorts of, you know, the, the format organ, you know, on and on, because of the triode tube. And in, with the uh, radios that he had at his disposal, he often noticed that there was a, um, uh, an opportunity that we've all heard, you know, watching Petticoat Junction or something, and you hear them tuning the radio, and it's wee wah. So it's a heterodyning a set of two oscillators heterodyning uh, to, to fix a frequency, basically. And so one knob is, you know, and the other is the volume. And he would actually play this as a musical instrument. He would actually, uh, the, the, the other people in his platoon would mention, you know, the howling Mexican dog, meaning a chihuahua, because he would just, uh, he would be moving these, these uh, frequencies around in an audible way because it reminded him of playing his cello, which is kind of amazing. Uh, so when he got out of the war, and the war ended, uh, things settled down a bit, he starts tinkering with the idea of actually bringing the radio into some sort of uh, immediate, which is a big word for him, an immediate sort of um, tactile, deep control to a human being. And um, this was happening in around 19, or excuse me, yeah, 1916, 17, his first experiments with this idea. Um, and as he moves forward with his sister Jeanette and his older sister Madeline, um, he's experimenting more and more. And eventually, when we get into the mid-1920s, um, there's a fellow in Russia, Led Theremin, who's doing a similar thing, but there's no direct evidence that they knew each other at all at, at this period of time. They did meet later, um, and it seems that a lot of Maurice Martineau's uh, demonstrations came soon after Theremin's demonstrations. For example, the Paris exhibition, you know, when, we, when we see uh, the first Theremin exhibit, uh, five months later, we have uh, Maurice Martineau uh, coming through the door and doing a similar program. Uh, here he is, and, and you might notice, of course, that the, the, the gestures are similar. But I think this is just form follows function. I don't think this has anything to do with uh, anything else other than that, and maybe perhaps just uh, cross-pollinating technologies being at work here, basically. Uh, the big difference is with Maurice uh, versus Theremin. Um, Theremin, uh, my personal opinion is that he was charmed by the ether wave idea, the, the idea that there's no contact, there's no physical contact with the body creating uh, some sort of interaction, capacitance interaction with the circuit. Um, and anyone that's tried to play a theremin knows what I mean. It's, it's, a, it's a very difficult instrument to manage. Uh, it takes a lot of training. And one of the ironies that I like to point out is that in theremin's case, um, when you're playing the instrument, your entire body is a, is a, a possible con, uh, 
a capacitance contaminant, so to speak, in the field that you're standing in front of with the, with the, with the antenna. So you have a volume antenna on his right, or excuse me, uh, on his left, and you have the, the pitch antenna on the right, typically, unless you're Pamela Kirsten. And, um, and so you, you, you have to stand stone still. If you watch Pamela play, even though if you just close your eyes and listen, you're expecting all kinds of gesticulation and all kinds of, of gestural movement to come with this, the sound that she's making, she's stone still as she's playing this instrument. And, and that's because she has to control the spatial relationship to the antenna so closely with her, with her hands, et cetera. So it's a very difficult instrument to manage in that regard. And Maurice's, uh, the, the whole raison d'etre for his interface, his gestural interface with the Ohm Martineau was immediacy and relaxation. He, he, he formed an entire uh, musical uh, human endeavor uh, philosophy around the idea of relaxing into your physicality with the instrument and abandoning oneself to gravity, for example, with the touche d'intense. You, you, as you're pressing the touche, you're, you're releasing the energy that, that accumulated before you took the action, before you made the gesture. And so all of this is pointed towards the idea of him being able to um, connect the human body and, and its, its uh, muse and its initiation to a, an electronic circuit that has vastly, uh, vast sonic potential, but also has an immediacy that can answer those questions or can answer those impulses like, like right now. He was almost allergic to the idea of automatism, to, to, to the idea of a machine being predeterminately uh, set up to do a thing. Like he would have not gotten Tonto. That would not have been his world. But he would appreciate, as he did with Bob Moog, he would appreciate the technology behind it and its timbral possibilities, et cetera. But he would feel probably that it was, you know, it was a divorce from the, from the human spirit because it's so disconnected in some ways, obviously. You know, there's, there's uh, opportunities for Robin's uh, exhibit the other night to uh, 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 sort of give you a moment of, of input. Anyway, so we go now to the Model 2. Now, both of these prototypes no longer exist as far as we know. The Model 1, we were told, was cannibalized for the Model 2. And it looks pretty much similar. This looks like the same radio box. To my eyes, I, I suppose, and it's, it's just a postulate, that perhaps this was an extant radio that was available in France at the time. There you can see many uh, radio systems that were for sale that, you know, you can find them on eBay all day long that, that look exactly like the same kind of decoration, the Bakelite knobs, et cetera, are all in place. And maybe Maurice just uh, sort of fashioned a, a way of controlling it with the string, as he did. So, this at a distance idea of having the ring, like so, um, was an, an interesting one, and he would try to sort of, it, one thing about it is it gave you some, some tactile feedback, it gave you some tension on the string, so the tension would increase with the springs inside the mechanism, and would give you an idea about what kind of tension you were putting into the system to reach the pitch that you were looking for. He would also mark out the floor so you had some visual representation of where you were with your hand in relationship, in relationship to the instrument. But he soon sort of um, had an epiphany about this and said, well, I don't have to do it in a vertical at a distance uh, sort of, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, just a, 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 like an indeterminate amount of space between here and there. I can actually, you know, we can use a keyboard just to lay out um, the boundaries for the keys, for example. So we've already gotten used to this idea. We've already, uh, we, we've, we've been looking at, uh, you know, uh, chromatic keyboard instruments for, you know, a couple hundred years, whatever, and, and he's like, let's take advantage of this and let's put a five octave keyboard in front of the instrument uh, and then stretch the string from left to right and then we can do the same, use the same kind of technology but therefore have some visual representation for where we're going with this with this ring that we're going to put on our finger. So that's what became the Model 2. And this, again, is an instrument. We, we know there's only one. We don't know uh, what's become of it. And believe me, I'm still looking. But anyway, um, so we go now to uh, the Model 3. And that would be this instrument over here. And so this is his first production instrument. 
This is the instrument that he debuted um, in, uh, at the Carnegie Hall. And let's see, what year was that? Um, 1930, so pretty early. And, um, but we're still, in this instance, without an actual mechanical keyboard. So this is an instrument that belongs to, to uh, Takeshi Harada in Japan. And uh, you'll notice that in, up here, this, there's a battery. That's a 12-volt battery. It was an alkaline battery from the era. And um, one of Maurice's concerns was he, he's still steeped in the idea that he needs to be able to incorporate his, his instrument into, uh, into the extant environment of you know, a symphony orchestra or, or whatever. And the last thing we want is a long AC cord dangling from the side of the stage to the middle of the auditorium, whatever. Um, so he incorporated this battery. And there's actually a voltmeter inside to tell you what kind of power you have available to you to make sure it's not going to die on you in the middle of the performance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the battery's often on the left-hand side over here on the other side of the drawer in this area. Um, again, we're triode tubes. Uh, we are a, a pair of heterodyning oscillators up here. Uh, we have some tuning availability here. But again, uh, no keyboard, uh, no action keyboard, no, no uh, mechanical keyboard. So um, the way the, the ribbon works is fairly fascinating to me. It, the original instrument, the earliest instruments, um, it's, it's a progressive capacitance system. Uh, what you're looking at here at the top is a ribbon of cloth that is, has sewn in gold thread. It's like uh, the French gendarme uh, epaulets you might have seen, uh, it's, it's sewn in to, to provide a continuous thread throughout the, the length of this thing. And so as you move your finger with the ring on it from, from right to left, you're increasing the length of this. I've got too many gadgets in my hand. Here we go. So here's the ribbon. Um, and so as you move your hand, you're actually um, increasing the capacitance of the, of the circuit, and you're lowering the pitch. So as you go from right to left, the ribbon circulates around the back of the case, et cetera. And that's how we determine the, uh, sorry, I need to go back and bring your attention to something else, sorry. Um, so these fingers that you see here, this is tuning. This is at that particular portion of, of the uh, circuit, this is how much proximity you want of this galvanized plate to be next to the ribbon. So you can do some small tuning adjustments. Later we'll see in the Mark and Model 6 instrument, he sort of gets away from the idea of having uh, individual fingers for each half step, each chromatic half step, but uh, he decides that you can actually do this much wider plates that are sort of bent into shape. Now, having tuned both kinds, I can tell you that this is a far superior way to tune this instrument. The, the, uh, the longer plates that are like a fourth or a fifth wide, when you bend in to try to get that, that E flat to be not so flat, you've gotten a situation where you've actually flattened the, the, the D, you know, whatever. So it's a, it's a kind of a dicey proposition. But we don't, let, we don't, we don't stay there long. Uh, let's see, where are we here? So here's just a close-up. It's, it's wood um, with just a, uh, an enamel painted on. Uh, this one's actually in pretty good shape. This is the instrument you see here. And this ends, this particular concept here ends with this model. Now this is the, this little portal that you see there is the um, ring at a distance idea again. So you open up this little hatch and you have a, a, a ring on a string that's connected to a, an internal mechanism that advances the same circuit again. Um, he, I, I, I just have the feeling, just a sort of a, 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 an intuition about this, that he wasn't ready to let go of this at a distance idea, that there was something about it that really attracted him, just perhaps you know the inertia of his explorations or whatever. And maybe Theremin, maybe th that was informing his decision as well, but this didn't last too long. So this is a close-up of that mechanism, and it's a fairly uh, elaborate system of pulleys that, that actually do this. 
Mr. Ms. Genevieve Robert playing her Model 3 on Martineau at home with the at a distance ring on her finger. Uh, notice that the tawar, the drawer that we pull out with all the controls, is on her left on a table. It comes out completely, and you can, as in with the Model 1 and the Model 2, you could bring it back as far as you like, whatever is comfortable for you. Here she is again. Beautiful mahogany cabinet. And now she's playing the ring on the keyboard as a guide. So I included this shot because this blew me away. When we were working on the Ondia instrument all these years later, uh, one of the primary concerns I had was what do we do about the ring? Because you've got one mechanism and you've got one way of wearing it. And how do we accommodate everyone's different finger size? Something as simple as that. And, and we went through all kinds of different iterations of, of how to do this. The Ole Martineau uses a spring in the Model 6 and the Model 7 uh, to, to grasp your index finger. Um, Maurice came up with this, which I think is genius, because the, there's this, uh, the string is under tension on both sides. So you simply slip your finger through the middle, and it just tightens itself to your finger. And I felt like a real idiot when I saw this, because I didn't think of that at all. But uh, anyway. Um, I love this. this is, the simplicity of this is, is so typical of him. This is a, the instrument that's at the MIM in Paris. Um, interesting, and I included it because this drawer right here is actually the at a distance uh, ring mechanism. And instead of putting it in the top up here, as he had done before, a good time to say this whole idea about models is a little bit of a construction on the part of myself and some other people that are really interested in this instrument, purely for communication reasons, because we have to be able to talk about which instrument we're referring to for a new change. But it's kind of fuzzy. There's the, the like with any small instrument manufacturer, um, as we go through the progress of the instrument development, we keep seeing small changes being made and offered up to performers and composers to see if they want to do something different. So this, this kind of continues throughout the entire development of the Omar Tano. And here it is again, with a palm in the distance. This is the D1, uh, well, just the loud, the Hopelur loudspeaker for that system. This is pretty clever. This is, uh, this is again, the Model 3. And this groove that you see right here is how the instrument uh, switches itself off. Um, this says, close the drawer. Um, there's a toggle switch mounted horizontally inside the cabinet on this side of the tour. And as you push the drawer in, it just flips the switch. I thought that was pretty clever. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll move it along if you like. <laughs> okay. 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 That's all right. Yeah, I'm a long-winded human from Oklahoma, so. Well, what can I tell you? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so um, and and so here we are with something that. Musicologists love to sort of discuss, at least I think they're loving it. Um, this little bag right here, it's a little rabbit skin bag, and it has a powder. So the first instrument that we restored or had anything to do with at all was this Model 6 setting here. This instrument here. Uh, this was Eric Sade's personal instrument. Uh, it came from Nathan Gerber and his family, who was Sade's son. Um, and uh, this instrument is actually here at uh, NMC when it was still uh, Cantos at the Customs House here in town. Um, I've had this, this was my first instrument and my first uh, exploration into this world. And um, when we got the instrument and we started digging around in it, we found three of these little bags and we're like, then there was nothing in them. We were like, well, what, what's up with these little guys? And uh, I mean, even opening them up and digging around, it just looked dirty. There was nothing, no clues whatsoever. At the time, I was working with a guy in uh, Golden, Colorado named Mark McCowan, who's sort of famous for uh, RCA theremin restorations, Ondi Aline, uh, and Ole Martineau in my case. And I'd work with Mark on, a, on an RCA theremin that we restored. And um, so we're, we're getting close to the end of the restoration of this instrument, and uh, we're grappling with this problem of the bag, like what's in the, in the little bag. And so I called a, a fellow that I know in, uh, in Sutton, uh, uh, Quebec, who, uh, Jean Landry is his name, and he, for 30 some odd years, has been the go-to repair person for the Owen Martineau community that's in Montreal. So he's been through most all of them. And uh, I called him and I said, you know, 
I'm blah, blah from X, Y, Z, and, you know, what's in this bag? You know, I told him what we were doing. And he said, well, I know what's in it, but I can't tell you. <laughs> it's a family secret, and I'm sworn, you know, blood oath, whatever, that I can't explain to you what's in that bag. So that went nowhere. So Mark and I sort of fooled around with it for another few weeks, and then Mark called me one day, and he said, well, I know what it is now. And Mark also restores old radios, and he's a very interesting character. Uh, he's a genius. He's a dam builder and dam designer, for, of all things, but beyond this. Uh, so he, he had dug the, the carbon pellets out of the transducer of a telephone, an old telephone. And he put it in a mortar and pestle, and he ground it up into a very fine powder. And of course, when you, as you compress carbon, it makes it you know, denser and, and more conductive. More, more current flows through the carbon, and therefore you get more volume. So we started, he, he tried, tried that a little bit. I tried it here in Calgary. And uh, what I discovered was, yes, the volume increases, but it crackles. It has this horrible crackling sound. It just sounds rotten. And so it, it just sort of became just another sort of intuitive leap that Perhaps we just need to lubricate these little carbon molecules a little bit with something. So I use baby powder. We just we we put baby powder in just a silicon uh, uh, mixture, uh, whatever different proportions to see what kind of uh, mi mixture it liked the most, and uh, that became our answer, and that worked. It worked beautifully, uh, with one small exception. So I called uh, John back and I said, "Hey, we know what the, what the powder is." He said, "No, you don't." I said, "Yes, we do." And so, you know, and we told him what we discovered, and he said, you're so close, I'm going to tell you what the third ingredient is. The third ingredient is cork. It's powdered cork. Because you want repetition, and you want the, the touche button to repeat as quickly as possible. So the other um, non-conductive uh, element in, the, in the, the magic powder is powdered cork. Now, nobody's making any money off this anymore, so I'm free to talk about this. <laughs> so it's not like the French are going to send somebody after me or anything. But anyway, uh, so that's what's in that little bag. And, and in the instance of the Model 6, uh, I'll get this real quick. This is the volume pedal. And you can see the little fellow in there. And it's just masonite type material. Uh, this is a re reproduction of the original but a very close one. Um, a resistor in place to trim it, as you would like. Uh, we discovered one interesting thing about the powder is that, uh, and which was used up until the Model 7, um, including the Model 7, I should say, is that the powder uh, sort of has to have a different ratio of non-conductive material and carbon, depending on the circuit that it's, that it's being placed in. In the Model 7, it likes a little bit less of, of, conduct, of, of current, basically, a little less current than the Model 6 does. Uh, so if we make the powder for someone, which we have done, then uh, we have to ask what instrument they're using. And because of you know, various entropic forces at work here, sometimes we need to trim even that because the caps and whatnot inside one of these older instruments is uh, fading and changing. So we might have to accommodate it a little bit more. And here it is again. And here it is again in a, in a Model 6. The French government spent a lot of money with the MIM in Paris looking at this. They did spectrographic investigations, all sorts of things, digging around trying to figure out what this powder was. They just needed Mark McCowan. You know. Okay, so here's the drawer from above. Uh, we have uh, uh, filter switches. So this is basically... Uh, just filtering and also some uh, a selection of the diffuser that you would like of the two that were available to the instrument. This switch right here is for the bag versus the uh, the keyboard clavier versus the bag or ring, and this of course is your is your volume control here. We'll move it along a little bit, and this is all in French, and I don't speak French, so. We're not gonna... uh, but it, it is interesting. It came with a very complete. One thing about Maurice Martineau is he was great documentarian when it comes to his instruments. He gives you every opportunity. As a matter of fact, uh, so much so that uh, he wrote an entire book uh, with his method describing all of these uh, technical details. So the Model 4, well, we call it the Model 4 because, big surprise, he's included a mechanical keyboard. And I think this was because he had 
um, in observing the, the performers on, on the first model, or the third model rather, that uh, we really need to address this issue. And again, he figured out a way uh, to impart vibrato, which is a thing that we, we talk about all the time in the Omar Cano world. Every keyboard should be able to do that as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> You know, I mean, I just, I love the fact that you can do this because it's, it, you know, for one thing, the, 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 the sonic archetype of vibrato and from a human voice, et cetera, which is something that he's very interested in, um, is available to you. And wow, you know, it kind of lit the world on fire. And we're talking about, uh, you know, 1929, Maurice Martineau brings us vibrato to the keyboard instrument uh, soon via the ring at first and then to the mechanical keyboard in 1934. So this becomes a fairly popular model, and we're going to look into it just a little bit more. So again, you can see the, uh, this is just by way of, of, of uh, uh, comparison. This is the Model 3 again. It goes around the entire inside of the cabinet. Power supply. Uh, the, uh, the touche is almost exactly the same. The, the, the Toro, rather, is almost exactly the same. Uh, this didn't progress much from, from the Model 3. Basically, he's just concentrating on, on what to do to improve this keyboard idea. So the first thing that he did is he moved the ribbon from, instead of running along the entire back of the cabinet, which I'm not real sure why he did that in the first place, but he did. Um, he, he moves it forward, and now the entire ribbon is underneath this panel. Uh, this is this instrument you see in front of you, and um, it's complete except for the batteries missing. So we don't have the battery. This voltage meter right here is to give you an indication of what, what kind of potential your battery has that day. Uh, here you see the ring. These hooks back here are how you park the ribbon on the back for playing the keyboard. So I'm going to move it a little bit faster now. So here we are with the, uh, with the plates for tuning and some capacitors in series to sort of tune that group of, of the um, plates. And here we have the underside of the new mechanical keyboard. So obviously with the Model 4, he's jumped way forward in his mechanical responsibility and his, his need to be clever with uh, solutions to the mechanical keyboard. Um, and it's, they're a nightmare to work on, as you can see right here. It, the one in the Model 6 nearly broke me. Uh, this is the instrument, I think this, yeah, this is still at MIM in Paris. Uh, another interesting thing about, that I forgot to mention, is that um, Maurice, after he had his initial um, very supporting uh, response from the, the Paris exposition, uh, his, his uh, concert at Carnegie Hall, um, he came, went back to Paris and he immediately got the idea that well, maybe we're now ready to go into production. He hired Gaveau to actually make the instruments, so piano maker Gaveau with you know, third only to Erard and Playel, I guess, uh, jumped, jumped in here and started making those instruments. So the, the Model 3 that you, or that you see here, it says, uh, made in Gavot in Paris. Um, by the time he gets to the Model 4, he's not liking that idea quite so much. He may, he, there's some documentation for him saying that he didn't really like their method of construction, thought it was not robust enough, et cetera but he divorces Gaveau from the manufacturing of it with the Model 4. Still says made in Paris, though. Okay, now we, have, now we take a, a, a much bigger leap forward because now we've decided that we need an instrument that's more portable so we can actually take this thing to you know, solo events instead of just ha hiring a cartridge service to drag it to a, 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 a large venue of some kind. Uh, interesting thing about this one is this ribbon, um, the music rack that you see here, uh, has been moved. Unlike this one, which is centrally located, I didn't really understand that when I first saw it until I sat down to this Model 5. Um, the reason he did that was because if you have it centrally located like that, unless you've got fairly long arms, the drawer is a long ways away from your music. So he, he gave you an alternate way to, to mount the, 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 uh, the score in front of you here. Handsome devil. Here he is with his uh, sister Jeanette playing a Model 5. 
Now this wood that you see here is some quarter sawn white oak. Uh, and it's very difficult to find these days. The Model 5 that we had that you see before you here, this one came out of an auction uh, called Vimea in, uh, in England in uh, 2018. And um, the instrument was trashed. The, the cabinet was a wreck, it was twisted. All the internal components are good, uh, need to be rewired, but, but were there present in pretty good physical condition. The cabinet was a waste. And the biggest reason I wanted to go into uh, restoring this instrument, uh, we don't restore them all. We restore the ones that, with a specific purpose, and this one fits that category. Uh, some of the most famous works, as we heard last night, are from Messiaen and Jolivet and other composers contemporary with this particular instrument. And in the scores, they give you the numbers they want you to select in the filtering. They give you the idea for which of the diffusers that he wants you to use. And uh, without a working instrument, there are three of these that I know of. One's at the MIM in Brussels, one's at the MIM in Paris, and there's another instrument actually that's kind of floating around that isn't complete. Um, we don't know what Messiaen intended. We don't know what it sounds like because the Model, model 3 and the Model 4 don't have those capabilities. And when he went to the Model 6, uh, when Maurice went to the Model 6, it's a completely different terminology for the way the filters operate. So the idea was to have someone like Cynthia Miller or Malcolm Ball or someone uh, reproduce or record or at least explore the Messian scores with an instrument that actually re reflects his intention with the instrument in front of him. Um, Messian was married to um, Yvonne Lorio, who was Jean Lorio's sister. Uh, Jean Lorio, who wrote well, the definitive book on books, I should say, on the own Martineau method. Uh, this was her instrument. This was this is where. She came into the picture, and uh, Messiaen started writing for it. Messiaen actually wrote the Tarangalila for Yvonne, but uh, Jean Lorio became the main exponent for that particular piece. Now Cynthia Miller and, and some of the contemporary artists are famous for playing it. But um, so I, I want to know what it sounds like. And this sort of talks a little bit about the whole mission here as well. Uh, the idea of a living collection. We need artifacts. We need static artifacts that, that haven't been molested by David Keene. Uh, you know. But at the same time, if we have them and they're available and we can you know, apply our scientific acumen to what it was and what it's become and what entropy has done, et cetera, we need to know what sonically what it's about. We need to know what the composer's intention was about. These things are important. It's funny looking sculpture. It's a musical instrument. So I, I'm, I'm constantly wanting to explore if it's legal, which by that I mean if there are other examples in the world, then we've, we've gone to a lot of effort to restore some of these instruments. Uh, this is the uh, premiere of uh, the Jolivet Concerto for the Martineau. This is Jeanette that we see here. And um, Yvonne is on piano, but I don't, we don't see her. Uh, this is at Symphony Hall in Boston in 1949. So this is the debut, really, of, well, it's the debut for sure of the Tarangalila. It's also the debut of this instrument here, which you see over here. This is, uh, we call it the palm, because it's palm-shaped, palm-leaf shaped. And this had actually been in development for uh, a few years before, before the concert. I think he started in 33, 34, to actually think about this instrument. Uh, Takeshi Harada in Japan has what we believe is the fir first palm that came from Jean Lorio as a gift to, to, to Takeshi. And that instrument is very definitely contemporary to his Model 3. Uh, here we are again with the quarter sawn oak. This oak was really difficult to find for our cabinet rebuild. Um, first of all, I didn't know what it was because I hadn't seen it. And you won't see it very often because those forests are pretty much depleted. Uh, the Spessart Forest in Germany allow a small number of logs to be taken out every year, and there's a guy in the U.S. who gets a ticket every year, and I found him, and he said, what are you going to do with it? And then he said, what's your credit card number? <laughs> and, uh, and so we bought some wood from him, and a very talented carpenter here in town uh, named John Lavoie uh, replicated the, this cabinet. We, we got drawings for the legs, which were missing, from Wim Wilhurst at uh, the MIM in Brussels. Uh, Wim, uh, kindly made a butcher block outline drawing for us, etc., and we managed to um, get the job done. This is what it looked like before we actually, uh, for you wood fanatics, uh, you know, uh, 
incredible looking wood before staining, anyway. Okay, so uh, real quick, this, these bulbs right here that you see, those are tubes. And I'm surrounded by vacuum tube technology most of my life, and I've never seen these before. So when we bought the instrument, I was like, what are those tubes? Because if you don't know what they are, you don't know if you can get them. And if you can't get them, you can't make it work. So I, one of my first questions to the seller was, what are the tubes? They're Phillips 4357s, and they're a voltage regulation tube. They're a neon envelope, and they have a helical coil inside. And uh, basically, you, you, uh, this is part of the power supply. And uh, without those, you <laughs> that's, that's the end of your voltage regulation. Uh, so here we are with two of them. We don't know if ours work yet because we haven't started it yet. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't turned this instrument on yet. Um, so why the chrome is one, one thing I would ask. Uh, here they are again. I'm glad I'm wearing clothes in this reflection. That's fortuitous. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no secrets now, Darcy. Uh, so there's a prop that holds the lid open a little bit on the Marl 5, and that's because you need some way of evacuating the heat that builds up inside the cabinet. It's a much smaller cabinet. He didn't have this problem with the Model 3 and the Model 4, but in this much tighter cabinet space, it was a problem. So he has these props that hold the lid open, and that informs what happens next, and that is that we didn't know why, well, first of all, you can't find these tubes. These tubes are non-existent. And we may end up having to use just some Zener diodes in place of the tube to make this thing work in the first place. We'll hide them, so you don't know they're in there. But um, anyway, so um, it turns out that neon has a very peculiar property, and that is that it's, it's uh, susceptible to photon contamination in this kind of circuit. Uh, basically, when, when photon enters the, 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 uh, the neon gas, um, I don't know whether the electron actually jumps a shell or exactly what happens, but it changes the ionization potential of the, of the tube. So your voltage, as the contamination comes in, the voltage reference drops. Your instrument goes out of tune. Bummer. So um, concurrent with this discussion I'm having with some people, we, we noticed this, and you've all seen this. Just a power bar, power strip, and US speak. So as the light falters in your den, this happens. And, and we couldn't figure out what exactly was going on there. We're like, why does the light bulb flicker? The, the, the friend of mine that brought this to my attention. And that's how we got to the, to the answer of the the mercury flashed inside of the tube for the 4357. And this is what they usually look like. So Maurice either just found some that happened to be mercury flashed or he ordered them that way. But these are almost impossible to find. This is what we in the business call unobtainium right here. Um, and this is what an ionizing co uh, helical coil inside of 437, uh, 4357 looks like when the voltage is applied. It's beautiful. Uh, next problem, cellulose, rampant in this era. Ondialines, on Martineau, uh, keys, uh, front panels, hates heat. So anytime they're subjected to any extended period of heat, this is what we get. This is not the original keyboard either. This, is, this keyboard's made out of American Holly. We did use the original Sharps, but all of the keys look like this. And this is, a, this is the Paris Expo for 1937, and uh, this is the uh, Festival of, of, of Waterfall. Uh, it's, a, it's a famous piece that was done at the Paris Expo with uh, eight, well, nine if you count the gentleman in the back, uh, with eight Omartineau Model 5s. I believe that the original cabinet that this one came in was one of these instruments purely because it was so hastily put together. It was a patchwork of veneer and really horribly made. So this is a Model 5 Tawar. Um, these are the numbers and the, and the, and the alphanumeric uh, designation for all the switches, et cetera. And this has prompted the Messian question. Uh, we've gone, instead of cellulose, uh, we've gone to a uh, Bakelite material for the, for the touche. I need to speed things up a little bit here. Um, this is the Model 6. And uh, with the Model 6, we've gotten even more compact, and we've lost an octave. 
So what he's done to accommodate that is in the middle of the keyboard, underneath the keys, there's a little switch, a little rocker switch that gives you the, uh, the octave up. V1, plain, just a plain loudspeaker. This is the Metallique. a short little video. Not much different than what I just did. Uh, it's just a transducer on the back of a gong. It's actually, uh, there's a little leather washer on there to sort of dampen the metallic contact, uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, cushion, so to speak. And here's the palm, which you see in front of you. So we have 12 strings on the front, and we have 12 strings on the back. And they're variously tuned. And most often, a known disc that actually uses one of these things, they're rare, A, and B, they're very quiet in their original, uh, the original palm design. Um, but you get more resonance, of course, if it's tuned with the keyboard, but for obvious reasons. So here's a little, brief little demonstration of this thing. It's very quiet, unfortunately. And yes, we make blue instruments sometimes. Occasionally. And I'm just sweeping the frequencies so you can see how it responds. Fascinating instrument, and uh, he he dabbled around with this quite a bit. Now we're actually building a new version of the of the palm for the Ondia production. Uh, we're almost ready. Well, I was hoping it would be ready for this event, but it isn't. But we've we've learned a lot rebuilding these, and one is that the the biggest problem with it is just the compression of tension of the strings without any kind of plate like you would have on a piano to take up this tension. And you know we want to build something that. What we have is actually two aluminum plates that are structurally responsible for tuning and anchoring uh, the strings on both sides. There's kind of a sandwich with a resonant body in the middle. And uh, so that takes the tension off the downward pressure along the rim, uh, et cetera, as sort of an A-graph kind of an idea. And then, um, and the tuners are much more stable. These things drift horribly with temperature. Uh, but the bigger thing is that we've actually made a resonant body that works. Um, Maurice was a brilliant man, but he wasn't an acoustician, and he didn't have the tools we have today. So we've hired a, a man uh, named Guillaume Rancourt in uh, in Elizabeth, uh, I think we're, he's in Sherbrooke, uh, Quebec, and he builds archtop guitars for a living. Beautiful archtop guitars, and he's a CNC uh, man also. He has a really great CNC uh, ability, and um, so he's uh, he took our frequency requirements and the string tension and et cetera, et cetera, and the frequency range we really wanted, and he built a model for us, and those tops are now done and shipping. So we should soon have, uh, it's a, quite a bit bigger just to support more bass frequencies, and but a lot more projection. This thing's really quiet. Nine times out of 10, if you see one at a concert with an ondist, it's there for looks. So model seven, let's get through this. Um, so this instrument, uh, the fascinating thing about this is that uh, this is an instrument that showed up at the, again at the Vimeo auction like two years ago. And this particular box here, this is a standard uh, D1, D2 combination, spring reverb, uh, main speaker, uh, the metallique, the palm, etc. This box here on the back of it says Redeco, R-E-D-E-H-K-O. Redeco was a, a speaker designer, a manufacturer, in Belgium that um, uh, he's kind of a controversial character these days because he builds hyper-efficient speakers, like very little magnetic uh, uh, inhibition of, of the cone movement. That's, that's his thing. He wants you know, very efficient, low, low wattage you know, amplification, et cetera. 
uh, one of the tricky things that he came up with was what he calls the Radeco reverberator. Uh, sure, we have this is a D1, D2 combination that, that's a, uh, springs in the bottom of this one and the regular cone speaker in the top. And here is the springs. Now, these are seven uh, very heavy brass extension springs that are anchored top and bottom. And in this area here, well, you'll see this bar that's welded across all seven of the springs. Behind this are two rods that go into the cone, into the voice coil of the speaker. So as the speaker is driving, it's exciting these springs. And this is what you usually hear in an own Martineau played today. Almost all of the owners these days either use one of our instruments, one of Jean-Luc Dierstein's Model 7 copies from, from uh, Paris, or an old Model 7. And this is almost always the, the reverberation effect that you hear is from a, a D2 like this. Now we've, we've been thinking all these years that uh, Maurice came up with this idea, but it turns out that he actually hired Mr. Rodeco to do these. Uh, so a little more cross-pollination of uh, technologies. Um, so here's the Rodeco version, and just called it the Rodeco reverberator. And here's a small Rodeco reverberator that I found on eBay last year. And it's about this big, and it sounds amazing. And this is the Model 7 drawer. So we're back to um, D1, D2, D3, and now we've adopted um, pipe organ technology, or vocabulary rather. Uh, this is for tutti, this is gambe, this is petite gambe, this is, uh, this is the O voice, the own voice, the pure, almost pure sine wave. A tiny bit of asperity in this sine wave just to make it not quite so boring. And uh, this is for crew and naziard, and this is the octavon, and this is amount of octavon. And this uh, slider over here is the amount of petite gambe that you can add. This is the touche for volume progression again. And here we have some transposition buttons, quarter tone down, quarter tone up, uh, a half step, whole step, third, and fifth. This switch over here is for souffle or breath, for chiff kinds of ideas. And this switch is for the clavier versus the bag. Now, with the Model 7, we're at transistors. We've given up on the whole idea of, uh, of, of using tubes. Uh, things have progressed. Uh, Maurice has decided that it's good enough that the transistor technology is advanced enough that he can use it reliably, and so he does. This is a brilliant owned disc. She's one of my favorite artists in the world. Her name is Suzanne Binet-Audette. She's from uh, Montreal, and she came to Calgary a few years ago and did a beautiful presentation of the instrument at the Rosé Center. It was fantastic. So now we come to the Ondia, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get through this quickly here. Um, the instrument's taught in Paris at three different universities. Uh, it's taught in Japan. It's taught in Strasbourg by Christine Ott and Thomas Bloch. Um, you're usually a piano major graduate of some kind. You've, you've gotten some sort of earlier degree, and then you can enter the program. It's a two-year program, generally speaking, I think. Um, so you get done with this, and what do you do? There are no instruments hardly to find. Um, these are up here because I, the only thing I'm really good at is collecting these things. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of work went behind it, but, uh, but they're very difficult to find. And when you do find them, they're insanely expensive, $25,000, $30,000 easily up from there. If you've just graduated from Strasbourg and Christine's class, uh, you may not have $30,000 laying around to explore your new education. So. We sort of jumped in on a project that was started in 1999. It got some real uh, momentum in the early 2000s from a man named Am Ambro Oliva, who was a, a, a friend, acquaintance of Jean Lario, again, um, this lady. Um, and he was an industrialist that uh, specialized in, in weighing equipment, like if you don't know how many grains of rice are in that bag, he was your guy. Um, and he was a music, uh, Aficionado, and he jumped in on this project, and he developed the original Ondea with her and another fellow named Lazare Levin, also in Paris. Um, so they did a number of things. Uh, we've, this is just a group of four that we built. Here's one in Paduk that we sent to Gauthier, actually, and bought this one. Um, a little soon for this. Um, so we, we sort of examined what Ambro did, and we talked a lot with the 19 instrument owners that, uh, that he managed to get through before he quit the, the project. Um, 
We wanted to know from the original owners what was working and what wasn't, which is a fairly normal question to ask if you're taking over a business. And um, so we, we learned some really hard lessons. Um, there were tuning issues, um, there were construction issues, and uh, when I say we, I mean myself and Dale Eulen, who's with us tonight, who's my electronics guru and uh, electrical engineer. We should give Dale a hand here. He's sitting back there. He's the long-suffering Dale Eulen. What should it do now? MIDI. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, hmm. And he would come back with an answer. But anyway, so we, we've made lots of, uh, lots of improvements to the instruments. Most, about the only thing that's left of the original design are some of the ergonomic ideas and the Tawar, which we're also working on a new version of, just to try to get it even quieter than it already is. Um, so um, we took it up and uh, decided that it was okay to infringe on French culture as someone from the States has been living here for 22 years and a couple of other Canadians you know, to help us and, and uh, to fill a void. And this is something that Oddities has done for years. We, we uh, bought a Mellotron in 1987 and resurrected the Mellotron. Bought uh, uh, the Helios, uh, you know, various and sundry uh, Abbey Road recording equipment, uh, Gleam and Pentaphonic clear synthesizers. We've done a bunch of these projects where as, a, as part of the curatorial process, we get really invested in its pertinence in a, in a contemporary way. Like, does it still have something to offer us? The thing about electronic music is that the biggest fatal thing about electronic music when it comes to musicology is that the technology changes so fast because it's always, again, cross-pollinated from other technologies that make your garage door open or whatever, and musical instrument designers are such passionate changers of, of, of what they've, you know, what, what, what's available to them that you, you, you come out with a musical instrument and it's probably going to be usurped in a year or two. So what happens as a result of that is we don't get uh, we don't get literature we don't get there's 600 works in volume three of the repertoire for the own Martineau 600 and more and it's because it was available because it was a genius answer to the question and because composers were writing for it you don't have a chance with the Roland widget X Y Z tomorrow because it may be gone the next day we about done. Okay, wrap it up here. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, so uh, this is what we've done, and it's, it's been very successful. We've built close to 40 instruments, somewhere in there. Uh, many of the old, uh, old Martineau users have, uh, have jumped ship, so to speak. They've bought one of these, and we don't need the old one anymore. They've ended up in museums. We've placed two at the MFA in Boston. We've placed one with EMEAP in Philadelphia, et cetera. So um, I think it's mission accomplished. Uh, we've had to do some things to accommodate uh, COVID lately because of supply chain stuff, et cetera. But anyway, so uh, I just want to get through this. This is uh, Marika Koger. She did the funny looking instrument or the beautiful paint job over here. She was the Beatles, one of the Beatles designers. She did uh, Eric Clapton's Fool guitar. And uh, I've known her for a while. And she, she saw this and she was just completely entranced and said, let me paint one for you. And so she did. And that's what you see there. Um, Okay, so there's our drawer, four instead of three diffusers. <laughs> it goes to 11. So anyway, um, we're gonna close now. Uh, I'm gonna I'll take questions right now and then I'm gonna play a short uh, video as you exit um, of, a, of a young lady named Aurora Dallamajor who's studying Ole Martineau with Estelle Lemire in, um, in Montreal, uh, playing the Ondia uh, in concert. So let's uh, just advance it one more here. Yeah, okay, sure. There's the new poem. <laughs> this is the book that you need to know about. If you're really interested in the history of this, Jean Larondeau wrote this book many years ago and it's fabulous. Many thank yous. I, have to do th I do have to thank Matt Bagstad who's here. He's, all, he's my CNC guru. He made this a operation that we can do here. We don't, we don't have to outsource because of Matt's help. And where's the video? And here she comes. It's fairly short. Can we have some volume, please?
Questions? Why don't we take a break if anyone would like to leave at the moment? I know there's quite a few people yeah. who want to. I won't be offended. <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering, is there any relationship or, or influence maybe uh, between the metallic and the uh, um, resonators used in the Cristal Bachet? Uh, oh, the Bachet? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. What, what year did the brothers come I out just, with the Bachet? I just looked it up. It's 52. 52. Well, perhaps. I mean, mm. it's, I mean, even further back than that, in the early, early teens, we have the Severi brothers with the, with the Carousalo which was, you know, various buggy springs and wood blocks and glass rods and whatnot in the ceiling. So the idea of exciting resonant bodies for a musical instrument is certainly not completely unique to the Omar to know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I said, early, early teens, like for sure. Next. Yeah. Uh-oh, Tom's gonna ask me a question. This is technical, but that's all right. You said the 1934 version, he could get vibrato from the keys. Yeah, I'm wondering how. How? It's a it's a uh, it's a wire that goes through the end of the keyboard that acts on a resistor. So that was independent for each key. Like no, it, no, no, no. It's the entire keyboard floats. Oh. Okay, so that's okay, true okay, about okay, all okay. of them. Uh, it's it's monophonic instrument A, and you know even though with MIDI we we've we've translated the MIDI. Uh, version of this, so, so your your key vibrato basically gets transmitted to controller, you know, controller seven or something or whatever. Uh, actually, channel pressure is what we use, and so uh, the the vibrato that can be interpreted then as pitch change in MIDI. So you can have all the polyphony you want and move it around. The instrument is a great MIDI controller because you've got six octaves of this ribbon that you can use in one mode as a pitch bend. So you can grab an entire handful and bend it six octaves, you know, which is amazing, and you can also track. The, uh, the ribbon with the, with the instrument's voice, as long as the pitch bending will do 73 half steps, which not all synthesizers with MIDI will do. But if you can do that, we send out a packet of MIDI information saying, set your pitch bend to 73. And, and if, the, if the unit can do that, then you can track MIDI with pitch bend. It deltas from the, from the, the touch control, so wherever the ribbon is when you plunge the touch control, that becomes the pitch, the note on no, uh, number, and then whatever you do from there is pitch bend until you release the touch. Very cool, thanks. Yeah. yeah. All right, we've got a question down in front. Okay, my question for you is, what is it like manufacturing on a relatively small scale in these days and in these times? Mm -hmm. And are most of your components from Canada, or where do you source the elements that you put in this okay. musical instrument? Yeah. Uh, Almost all of it is Canadian. The wood is from Ontario or Quebec. Um, almost all of it, except for in the case of the Model 5, which is German wood. Um, we do, uh, when I say we, Matt and I do the design and execution of CNC cabinet making for the speakers as well as the, and we're also doing the keys. Matt's been actually fabricating the keys for us, uh, which was a daunting process actually, and he did a brilliant job of it. But um, I think the only thing that we source out of Canada, uh, the PCBs are made in China by Golden Phoenix. Uh, so Dale designs them and we send them off to Golden Phoenix and they've done a brilliant job with that. And um, the legs are actually fabricated. The legs were a big problem because they're, it's a complicated bend and there's a company called Aggressive Tube Bending in, in Surrey, BC that just liked the idea and so they took it up. But we're small potatoes. You know, We build like six or maybe 10 instruments a year. And so this is the problem. This is always the problem with modern instrument design and, and execution. You're, you're doing a few pieces. You know, nobody's come up to me yet ordering one of these. So, you know, it's, it's really, it's a difficult process when you, you know, everything on here, except maybe the cup washers and perhaps the, the hinges, is custom fabricated. All the hardware is custom fabricated. So, and, and that was somewhat by design, but also by, by uh, effective, that's what we inherited. And uh, uh, the, I'll close with this example. This thing was originally specced in, in metric metal. You don't do metric metal, even though we're supposedly a metric country in Canada, you don't do metric metal here. If you want metric uh, aluminum profiles, you have to go to the states who will order it for you once you give them your credit card again. And uh, you, they will order it from Hungary or they'll order it from you know, Italy or whatever. If you want 15 by 15 rectangular tube, you don't buy that in Canada. 
So we bring it in, and it's expensive. These instruments are $12,000 US a piece. It includes the two speaker boxes, the cabling, cases, etc. cetera. It's, it, it's well worth that, but I wish I could charge like half that and still make a living at it, but it's impossible. It's just not possible to do. Uh, this is a no compromise design. No compromise in any way, shape, or form because I wouldn't disrespect everything that Maurice Martineau has done and all the people that have been his, his, you know, his admirers and performers from his world uh, by doing something halfway with it. Anyway, you thank you for the question. Yeah. And on that note, if you want to leave your credit card details with David before you leave, you can put in your orders now.